Thanks to Judge Andrew Napolitano. Always lovely to have you here, sir. Do you Such have any... Such a great uh, yeah. show where we can tackle the serious and the ridiculous <laughs> at the same time and, and stay good for That's friends. the daily news, Judge. Yes, it that's is. That's what happens. We laughed. Right. We haven't cried yet. No. The day is young. <laughs> Some of the things we've talked about today are worth crying over. Like, uh, actually, like Harrison's got a topic. paper cut. She might be crying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Happening now. Oh, sorry. Ha wow, that's the wrong show. Harris, here she is. Fox News alert now. A top North Korean official is set to land any minute in the United States as summit talk picks up steam. We'll go outnumbered over time now. I'm Harris Faulkner, New York's JFK Airport. That is where Kim Jong-chul, the North Korean official known as Kim Jong-un's right-hand man, is expected to arrive in the next hour or so. The former spy chief will be the highest ranking official in nearly two decades to visit America. He will meet with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as the White House says it now expects President Trump's summit with Kim Jong-un to take place. All this, as a new CIA assessment has reportedly concluded, Kim's regime has no intention of giving up its nuclear weapons at any time soon, or program that is. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Governor Bill Richardson, has extensive experience in dealing with the North Koreans and says this. This is a good sign, whether uh, the summit takes place June 12th, if it's put off a few days, a couple of weeks, I think that's fine. Let's be completely prepared. I think the president needs to be flexible. And he did say that he was ready to see a phased withdrawal, a phased movement of denuclearization by the North Koreans instead of just instantaneous. Let's get more facts. Rich Edson now from the State Department. Rich? Good afternoon, Harris. And the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is scheduled to meet with President Trump in just about an hour. Then he travels to New York. The State Department says he will be there today and tomorrow to meet with one of Kim Jong-un's top lieutenants. He is the vice chairman of the Central Committee. Kim Yong-chul, deeply involved in North Korea's recent diplomacy. He's joined Kim Jong-un for meetings with South Korean President Moon Jae-in and Chinese President Xi Jinping. Now he's trying to coordinate this summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, expected June 12th in Singapore. Kim Yong-chul has already met the Secretary of State. Pompeo traveled to Pyongyang Easter weekend as CIA director, then weeks later as Secretary of State. And as Kim Yong-chul travels to New York, he is still under U.S. sanctions. He's suspected to have been involved in North Korea's nuclear program, the sinking of a South Korean ship in 2010, even the hack of Sony in 2014. U.S. officials are also coordinating with the American allies on this expected summit. The State Department says Secretary Pompeo spoke this weekend with foreign ministers from South Korea and Singapore and will meet with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe next week in Washington. He'll also meet with the president at the White House. So just over the past few days, the administration has dispatched teams to Korea and to Singapore to try to set up this summit. They've got a very aggressive timeline to work on here, Harris. Not only do they have to plan for the summit logistics about traveled there and venues, but they've also got to lay the groundwork for the actual discussions of how North Korea is going to try to surrender its nuclear weapons program, what it will receive in return, and when it will receive it. There was also a bit of a pause in discussions between the United States and North Korea uh, that uh, President Trump then fired off that letter threatening to cancel the summit and then planning resumed from there. So they're really trying to get this thing going for June 12th in Singapore. Harris. Rich Edson, thank you very much. My first guest now, Republican Congressman Duncan Hunter, sits on the House Armed Services Committee. Great to see you today. Let's talk about the logistics of getting things done in time for June 12th or any close date to that. How significant do you think it is that the president says the door might be open to a more incremental dismantling of the nuclear program by North Korea? I think it's it's good no, no matter what. The, I mean, the uh, the ultimate downside here is that North Korea launches a uh, nuclear weapon at the U.S., one of our territories, at J Japan or South Korea, right? That's the that's the worst thing that can happen. Anything short of that, especially with, with the uh, Korean top spy turned turn diplomat coming to meet with our top spy turned diplomat, any anything going forward now is positive. And I think all they need to do now is prepare so that both sides know what's what what they expect out of each other. Because the biggest downside i think or the biggest downfall that's a possibility is each each side meaning us and the north koreans mm -hmm. expecting something from the other that we're not willing to give so we get that done in the beginning so that hopefully the the uh, summit when there is one is kind of more of a dog and pony show as opposed to something that where where the uh, the real work already got 
done, and now they're, they're just going to meet and kind of, you know, sign the papers. Hopefully that's what's going on. You know, with your background, I would imagine that the idea or the necessity for actually eyes on the ground, keeping up with what they do with those weapons if a deal is made, looking at those assets, how do you get that done? Because we haven't been particularly effective uh, in Iran. So we know we pulled out of that deal. How do you make it different for North Korea? You don't. You ask for the, for the exact same things. You ask for the international community uh, to come in and make sure that the North Koreans are dismantling. That's, that's the only way to do it. You have to have proof and you have to have uh, eyes on. And that's why we pulled out of the Iranian deal. One of, of the many reasons, um, because they would not allow us to search their military facilities. The, the North Koreans are going to have to be open and transparent. And, mm -hmm. and if they're not, then I expect Trump to move even more military power to that area and to put more uh, sanctions and pressure on them. Can you speak to the shift in all of this? And I know the president uh, had canceled the summit and then he wrote that letter. And then the North Koreans, though, started this conversation with wanting to sit down. So, yeah, as, yeah. yeah go ahead. Give me your thoughts. on. So, it. I mean, uh, this is what happens when President Trump acts alone as America first, putting America first, but also asks our, our allies to come in. But we we led the way and there was there was was so much military pressure in the area. I mean, we, he moved he moved lots of gear, Band-Aids, bullets and food into that area, lots Lots of people have been moved into, into Korea now, I, I think, even more hmm. so than, than is being re reported right now. There's lots of military hardware there, and I think that made Kim Jong-un move, period. I, I think it was that. And frankly, when, when his family and friends and advisors went to South Korea and saw the Olympics there, I personally think that had a, a lot to do with it, too. I think they saw why? the McDonald's, the nightclubs, the mini skirts, the steaks, and said, hey, why can't we live like these South Koreans? Because um, mm -hmm. you had some inner party people that went down that might have thought it was fake, but realized that that's the way that... that the West lives. It's a nice way to live. And I think you combine that with the military pressure and then the olive branch that Trump's given him saying, hey, if, if you guys are friends with us, you'll have Ford factories, you'll have food, your people will be working, it'll be great, uh, ice cream for everyone. I, I think all those things together have made this happen. You know, I, I'm curious, though, about what Kim Jong-un tells his own people, because the president had to walk out and say, look, we will protect you because we know how violent and vicious they are. They kill their own people in North Korea. So the question is, can he stand up in that regime uh, after a summit and after a deal and, and, and actually live? And we've promised to protect him. What does that look like? So, so I think Kim Jong Un uh, is he's seen as a god. The Uns are the, the whole family are seen like gods in in Korea. They have no internet, they have no TV, they have no telephones. They don't know what the outside world looks like. They don't know how the rest of the, of the world lives. I, I think he'll be fine if he pulls this off. Hopefully, I mean that's that's what what political leaders do. They'll, he'll he'll do this and he'll go back and make it look like a big win for North Korea. Mm. And 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 that's fine though. I, I don't care what he does, frankly, as as long as they denuclearize and they can't launch inter continental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads at us at us or our allies or, or territories i don't care what he does and and i'm happy to help him look good too we had to send dennis rodman back over there and uh oh try, to try to make even more friends well you know i was reading even flying here i mean just leaving north korea is difficult for any of them yeah, it, it, this is a closed dictatorship, a, a real life one. It, it's kind of interesting for us to even have a concept of what it's like for them, but they're totally closed off to the outside world. The government can kill anybody, a, arrest anybody, put you in work camps. I mean, it, it is a real dictatorship alive and well in, in 2018. And mm -hmm. it, it'd be awesome to see Trump dismantle that and at, at least offer the olive branch of saying, look, here's how the rest of the world lives. You too can be like this. You just got to be uh, friendly. Yeah, I, I was just finding it fascinating that even when the leaders move, they move on the ground. Uh, any kind of air support has to come from elsewhere. Uh, Congressman, thank you very much, Congressman Duncan Hunter. Thank, Thank you. you All right. So you've given us a lot to talk about with my next guest now, Brian McCain, who served as principal deputy undersecretary of defense for policy under President Obama. I'm so anxious to talk with you about where we are uh, that we haven't been before. And politics aside, what impresses you about what we're learning today? Well, we've got an interesting process that the president has launched. It's a little uh, upside down from the usual diplomatic process with North Korea, where you try to set the groundwork with many meetings at lower levels and try to come up with some kind of framework or detailed agreement that the leaders can then come in and bless. And the short time frame that the president has given to this has put a lot of pressure on the system. And so we'll, we'll find out very shortly whether this is going to work. Uh, 
I would emphasize that it's more important to get it right than do it fast. So if they can't meet this June 12 target, Sure. I don't think that's the end of the world. I think they need to have a well-prepared meeting for the two leaders. Or, or actually, perhaps this is just the beginning of a series of meetings, too. I mean, I, I'm, you know, you, you've got to be open to that. You can't get it all done. But I want to go back to something that you just said, upside down from the usual. Perhaps that's why we got here. Uh, in part, yes. I, I'd say there's three elements that led to this moment. One is the pressure campaign of the international sanctions, which give credit to the Trump administration, but also putting the pressure on China to actually enforce the sanctions on its border. Second, the president of South Korea uh, took the initiative before the Olympics to reach out to the north, and he really set some of this in motion. And third, we don't know for sure, but I think part of this relates to Kim Jong-un making his own calculation that his nuclear and missile program is at a place where he wants it to be, that he's more secure in his own domestic political, mm -hmm. si political situation, and therefore he feels ready to uh, roll the dice a bit on negotiation. Wow, you are one of the first people that I've heard mention China in this way, and I'm curious about that, because China upholding its sanctions, you say, played an important role in all this. Just a few days ago, the president was talking about every time China's leader got together with Kim Jong-un, it seemed like North Korea walked farther and farther away from their promises. Do you see China differently? Well, China for a long time has played a little bit of a double game in the sense that they have worked with us in multilateral fora to put pressure on the North Koreans, but at the same time, they did not want a collapse of the North Korean state and have A, a huge flow of refugees across their border, hmm. and B, a unified Korean peninsula, which is controlled by the South Korean government with American forces on the ground uh, closer to their border. So they have a lot of different interests at stake. But they did implement the same more detailed agreement that provides the sort of verification that Congressman Hunter was talking about. But wow. I think it's a good sign that this Vice Chairman Kim is coming to the United States that both sides really want this summit to happen. Brian McCain, formerly of the Obama administration, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Roseanne Barr taking aim at a liberal media double standard, she says, after ABC canceled her hit TV show after her racist tweet. Is she right to cast blame, or does she deserve to be fired? Well, it happened already. Media Buzz's Howard Kurtz will weigh in. Can't wait to talk with him about this. She said she was getting off Twitter. She's not. Plus, President Trump once again ripping Jeff Sessions, saying he wishes he had chosen a different attorney, attorney general. What it could mean for the Robert Mueller Russia investigation. Stay close. Jeff Sessions as the attorney general is there in name only. He's absolutely worthless. The sooner the president names a new attorney general, the better. Uh, it, he should never have recused himself. He didn't need to in a counterintelligence operation. Fox News alert. The president tweeted this morning that he wishes he had chosen a different attorney general. This comes after the New York Times reported the president pressed Jeff Sessions to reverse his decision to recuse himself from the Russia investigation back in March of 2017. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live at the White House with more on this. John. Harris, good afternoon to you. Not a good day to be Jeff Sessions. Like so many other days during this administration, the president probably more forceful than he has ever been today in suggesting that he never should have appointed Jeff Sessions to be the attorney general. This comes after the chairman of the government oversight committee in the House, Trey Gowdy, made some comments on television this morning saying that he can understand the president's frustration with Jeff Sessions after recusing himself in the Russia investigation. If I were the president and I picked someone to be the, the country's chief law enforcement officer and they told me later, oh, by the way, I'm not going to be able to participate in the most important case in the office, I would be frustrated, too. That's how I read that is, is Senator Sessions. Why didn't you tell me this before I picked you? There are lots of really good lawyers in the country. Mm -hmm. He could have picked someone else. Well, the president was infuriated after he heard all of that in a lengthy tweet do, uh, putting the entire uh, Gowdy quote out there on Twitter, including the last line. There are lots of really good lawyers in the country. He could have picked somebody else. And the president adding in his own language, and I wish I did. Gowdy with another significant statement, though, in the past 24 hours that the president did not quote on Twitter today. Gowdy telling our Martha McCallum last night that uh, his meeting at the DOJ last week about that confidential informant the FBI was using to gather information on three people associated with the Trump campaign convinced Gowdy that the FBI didn't do anything wrong.
I am even more convinced that the FBI did exactly what my fellow citizens would want them to do when they got the information they got and that it has nothing to do with Donald Trump. Both of those will be big topics. The briefing scheduled for 2.45 this afternoon, along with the latest on where the North Korea talks stand. Harris? John, thank you very much. Let's bring in Utah Republican Senator Mike Lee. He is the author of Written Out of History, The Forgotten Founders Who Fought Big Government. Senator Lee is also on the Judiciary Committee, so right spot on for this topic of conversation. Great to see you. Good to be here. Yeah, great to have you in studio today. Uh, let's talk about whether the president is right in your estimation that Jeff Sessions should unrecuse himself. Not really sure if that's a word, but we'll go there. Well, look, I don't think either the president or Jeff Sessions saw what was coming. I don't think either one of them necessarily could have predicted what had happened. Jeff Sessions had to make the decision at the time he made it. I don't know whether he made the right decision or not. I, th mm -hmm. I think reasonable minds can disagree on that conclusion. I do understand, like Trey Gowdy said, why the president might be frustrated. It's not ideal for him. What role can or should Jeff Sessions play as attorney general right now? He didn't, I mean, what does the recusal mean for some of the things that you would want to happen in an investigation yeah. right now. As long as he's recused, once he recuses himself, unless or until such time as he unrecuses himself, he can't touch it. He's, he's not Any the attorney general. No, he's, he's not the attorney general for that issue. And it falls on the next in line, which is Rod Rosenstein. Now, mm -hmm. if he were to reverse that, that changes. But uh, until that happens, unless or until that happens, it's Rod Rosenstein and it's not Jeff Sessions. What do you make of the president back in at what the New York Times is reporting March of 2017, pressuring him to reverse that recusal? Well, uh, perhaps he looked at it uh, uh, with White House counsel Don McGahn, as uh, some are suggesting, and said he didn't need to do it. If that's what they were doing, saying I, uh, recusal seems unnecessary, then uh, that would explain why they went to him and uh, tried to encourage him to, to undo it. Apparently, Attorney General Sessions wasn't comfortable with that. Senator Lee, what would you want Sessions to have the power to do exactly right now? Well, nothing, because he's not the Attorney General for this issue. He's recused, right. if so he, he's, he's if out. If he had not recused himself, what would you if, be looking for If he were back in, if he be? unrecused himself today, uh, it would be the same that I would hope that Rod Rosenstein is acting Attorney General on this issue would do, which is to encourage Mueller to wrap it up. I mean, the guy's had a year. Let's wrap it up. Finish your investigation. Finish whatever report you're going to produce. But get it done. This doesn't need to drag on for four years. And the fact that Rod Rosenstein hasn't done that. I mean, what? How? How much can the president get involved to, to put pressure on this? Well, typically, presidents don't get involved in a decision like this uh, a, a lot. But uh, ultimately, these people all work for the president, and and, and they and read his Twitter. No doubt, design. they see it. Yes, and it's by design. Yeah, they're put in place by a president. They're they're put in place by that president with Senate confirmation, and they serve at the pleasure of the president. And so this is uh, within the executive branch of government. The president's the boss. The inspector general could testify before the Senate Judiciary uh, next week, and you're anticipating, you and I were talking off camera, that we could even have some sort of report from the IG. What will you talk with him about? Well, it depends on what the IG report says. We do expect that within the next few days. We don't know exactly when. So you want to talk to him after that's yes, out? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I want to re review the report and talk to him. Okay, and for right now, there have been, you know, at least some words thrown out that this will be explosive, that the IG has had an opportunity to look at things that others haven't seen. I, I don't know. We can't know that until we hear from him, until we, until we see his report. But I do know this. Um, the, the mere suggestion that there's been involvement by the FBI in a political campaign, if true, that's mm -hmm. very deeply disturbing. And it's understandable why a lot of people would be concerned about that. All right. So Democrats and others have pushed back and said, no, 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 this is how you do it. Uh, and that there was nothing untoward to having an FBI informant looking into a campaign, and you say what? Well, if that's the case, why didn't they go to the campaign? Why didn't they go to President Trump as a candidate and say, here's what we're doing? That, that is a why do you I've think got. they didn't? I don't know. And it's one of the questions I want to get to the bottom of is why didn't they do that? And, and if they didn't do that, um, does that tell us anything about what their intentions were? Have you talked to Democrats at all about this issue? Not much. The, this issue has uh, gained a lot more momentum in the last few days, and, mm -hmm. and I haven't had a lot of discussion. The reason I ask you is, wouldn't it be an American problem <laughs> if we have FBI informants looking into sure. campaigns? It wouldn't be the first time, but I, I, I'm just curious, on the Hill, do you have that kind of gestalt view on it? Yeah, I, I, look, I think 
Democrats, if it comes out that they were deeply involved in a campaign, that they were engaged in some type of partisan manipulation of a political campaign, I think that's an issue that would be concerning to both Republicans and Democrats alike. Mm -hmm. And what kind of accountability comes after that? Well, it depends on what they did. But if there was something nefarious going on, if there was an intent to disrupt a campaign or affect the outcome of it, that's huge. That's monumental. That's catastrophic. And that's something that would need to be addressed through legislation and through oversight. Senator Lee, great to have you today. Good to Thank be Thank you for your time. Thank you. President Trump is going after Democrats on immigration reform ahead of the midterm elections. Could this be a winning tactic for Republicans or could it backfire? Our power panel will weigh in, plus the commander in chief weighing in on the Roseanne Barr controversy, why he's accusing ABC of a double standard. Stay close. President Trump now weighing in on the Roseanne Barr controversy after ABC canceled her hit TV show over an offensive racist tweet targeting former Obama advisor Valerie Jarrett. The president tweeted this. Bob Iger of ABC called Valerie Jarrett to let her know that ABC does not tolerate comments like those made by Roseanne Barr. Gee, he never called President Donald J. Trump to apologize for the horrible statements made and said about me on ABC. Maybe I just didn't get the call. This after Roseanne Barr also spoke out, apologizing to her castmates, but also retweeting posts blaming a liberal media double standard. Meanwhile, Valerie Jarrett had this to say. I think tone does start at the top, and we like to look up to our president and feel as though he reflects the values of our country. But I also think every individual citizen has a responsibility, too. And it's up to all of us to push back. Our government is only going to be as good as we make it be. And as Reverend always taught me, you have to be people on the inside have to push hard and people on the outside have to listen. Let's bring in now host of Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz. Uh, Howard, I, I just want to kind of gauge where we are because Roseanne Barr said she was leaving Twitter. She's back on Twitter. And it's interesting because she's blaming everything from a double standard to Ambien for her racist yeah. comment. It was a bizarre tweet storm last night by Roseanne Barr, and obviously she's emotional. So she is lashing out at her critics, including uh, accusing a couple of fellow cast members of throwing her under the bus. At mm. the same time, she's apologizing. She's telling people not to defend her because what she did was inexcusable. And Ambien, I mean, come on. Uh, Ambien uh, is it, a pretty lame defense. Ambien, not on the bottle that it causes racism. Uh, and so now, where does ABC go in all of this? Because they have fired her. They have moved on. Uh, and she's invoking that, well, it's a double standard based on ABC's behavior with others. Well, you know, as far as what the president tweeted, I did find it noteworthy that he didn't choose to make even a perfunctory denunciation of Roseanne's tweet hmm. about Valerie Jarrett. And, you know, I'm sure the president thinks that ABC News has said many unfair things about him. I doubt any of them are as horrible as the frankly racist and ugly uh, thing that Roseanne said about the former Barack Obama aide. As far as ABC, I mean, look, first of all, the network deserves credit for creating this show, for reviving it from the 90s version and making a pro-Trump character uh, the centerpiece of it. So ABC didn't want to get rid of this show. It was making a lot of money for the network, but felt, uh, I think, and particularly because it involved the third rail of race, uh, that it had no choice but to fire Roseanne and fire her quickly. Can we just get real a second about who Roseanne Barr is? Because her racist uh, take on life, if you will, didn't just begin yesterday with that tweet. She has a history. There are reports that she showed up somewhere with a Hitler mustache. I mean, there, she has a history. This is Roseanne Barr. And, you know, I mentioned on this program yesterday, it is free speech. It is free speech with dire consequences for her career at this point. Uh, I'm just curious, you give ABC a lot of credit. They also put Paula Dean on Dancing with the Stars after she dropped the N-word on another network. Uh, or not another network, but in life. So uh, are, do the networks deserve that much credit? Well, I'm just saying that uh, ABC, you know, wanted this to be a hit show. But at the same time, you know, I have to say in, in, in response to your very trenchant observations um, that I ABC was in a dilemma and was under a tremendous amount of pressure. And yes, ABC executives knew exactly who they were getting with Roseanne Barr. Years and years of conspiracy theories about 9-11, about Nazis. Uh, even yesterday before or around the same time, she tweeted a false rumor about Chelsea Clinton. Yes. So ABC took a gamble here that Roseanne was going to somehow behave on social media. In retrospect, that was a pretty bad bet. You know, Howard, you have been watching the media and reporting on it for so many years. I lean on your expertise now. Are we at a tipping point? And will that tip 
tipping point spread if we are to other areas? I mean, you've got Bill Maher, who years ago also said something, calling Americans cowards after 9-11, lost his show on ABC, and then pops up on HBO, had success there, and in 2017 utters the N-word. He's still sitting there. Right. And in fact, Bill Maher, five years ago, compared Donald Trump's hair to that of an orangutan. So, you know, that, that seems like a pretty grave offense. Look, there, there are all kinds of double standards here. There are all kinds of comedians and performers and television personalities who say and tweet crude and rude and offensive things uh, and nothing happens to them or they get fired or they get suspended. There's no one standard. Every media organization has to um, search its own conscience when something like this happens. How do you weigh the fact that a lot of people are employed by this show, the millions of people love this show versus this clear mistake, which even Roseanne now says, don't defend me. It was inexcusable. It was indefensible. I agree with her on that point. And then she uses the ambient defense. Uh, yeah. Let's let me pop this up on the screen. This is something that Roseanne Barr retweeted anti left posts. Look at this. And I, I'm just curious from your perspective, having watched these things, what you think. Normal Americans are watching in absolute shock as leftist maniacs indulge in yet another political sacrifice. It won't end well for you guys. How well, what does that mean? I'm not sure what specific thing she's referring to, but look, Roseanne uh, has every right to spew, uh, to, to fight back against the left if she considers herself more conservative. A lot of what she says is unproven and ugly. And as you noted, sure, she has every right to say it, but she doesn't have a constitutional right to have a sitcom on no. the air. It's, and, uh, and that's the line she crossed. It's truth that we know about Roseanne Barr, and it's met with consequences, truth and consequences. Real quickly, some of the pushback from conservatives has been they don't feel like they have a voice enough in entertainment. And they celebrated the show away from all of what she would tweet and say because of that. And they are right. And it would be a shame if the fallout from this particular controversy deterred ABC and other networks from creating other shows that appealed more to the heartland, uh, to more than just the left-leaning elites in New York and Hollywood and, and, and D.C., uh, because this show touched a nerve because there is so little entertainment programming that people on the right or people with Trump supporters feel uh, at home watching. And so that, that should not be forgotten, despite yeah. the fact that Roseanne just kind of went off the rails here. Yeah. Howard Kurtz, always great to talk with you. Thank you Thanks, very much. Alice. Thank you. Designs to honor rescue and recovery workers unveiled at the 9-11 Memorial in Lower Manhattan. Many of those who spent weeks and months at Ground Zero died after being exposed to deadly toxins. Rich Leventhal is live in New York City. This is happening today. Let's learn about it. Rick, tell us. Well, Harris, the architect faced a daunting task to redesign a portion of this beautiful, powerful and finished eight acre memorial site with something that looks like it was always here and doesn't overwhelm the rest of the plaza. And this cause was critically important to all of those first responders and everyone who got sick and the families of all of those who died. Of course, tens of thousands of firefighters and police officers and other workers spent months here at Ground Zero exhibiting strength and courage, sacrificing their own health, breathing toxic air to clear the rubble and recover the victims of the worst terror attack ever on U.S. soil. As many as 400,000 people in all were exposed to the contaminants, and this evolution of the memorial is a tribute to all of them. A dedicated space in the southwest corner of this plaza, a, a grassy area called Memorial Glade next to the survivor's tree, which will include a long pathway where the ramp into the pit once stood, flanked by large stones that the architect says will be worn but not beaten, symbolizing strength and determination through adversity. Earlier today, I spoke with former Daily Show host and comedian John Stewart, who played a significant role in making this redesign happen. We'll never be able to repay that debt. But the least we can do is provide them a place of comfort, solace, and community on the memorial with their brothers and sisters, with all those that they saved and helped, that they know is a testament to all they did for us and all they did for the city. They haven't actually broken ground yet, and it's not clear when this redesign will be finished. It could be months, perhaps sometime next year, Harris. The folks here say they just want to make sure they get it right. Rick, thank you very much. Let's look at the live picture now as we await the arrival of a top North Korean official at New York's John F. Kennedy International Airport ahead of his meeting with Secretary of State Pompeo. We'll bring you updates as this develops. Also, President Trump, 
going after Democrats on immigration and blasting House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi for her previous comments about MS-13 gang members. What impact could it all have on the midterm elections? Power Panel, next. President Trump is targeting Democrats politically on immigration ahead of the midterm elections. Here's what he had to say during a Make America Great Again rally last night in Tennessee. Chuck and Nancy, they don't want the wall. They want open borders. They're more interested in taking care of criminals than they are in taking care of you. The Democrats want to use it as a campaign issue. And I keep saying, I hope they do. The fact is, the Democrats are lousy politicians. They're lousy on policy. Could the strategy help Republicans win in November? The Power Panel now. Former Hillary Clinton campaign staffer and former DNC advisor Zach Bacanis is here. And RNC spokeswoman Kaylee McEnany. Uh, Kaylee, I'm going to start with you. Uh, is this a winning strategy for Republicans? No doubt about it. You know, this is the message that won President, Tr President Trump the 2016 election. It's the message that will win Republicans or keep ha have Republicans keep the House. You look at Suffolk County, Harris, not far from where you are out on Long Island. This area, John Kerry won it. Barack Obama won it twice. Al Gore won it. But President Trump carried Suffolk County by eight points. Lee Zeldin beat an eight term incumbent there. They won it by talking about illegal immigration because MS-13 has wreaked havoc on that community. This is a winning message and it will drive Republicans to victory in November. Zach, how do Democrats counter this? Well, look, I mean, Kaylee wants to talk about 2016, but let's talk about 2017 and 2018. We have two very specific races, Virginia, the Pennsylvania congressional race, where immigration played a very key role in that race. The Republican was relentless in attacking the Democrats on the issue of immigration, and Democrats won that race, not by a little bit, but by a lot. This issue does not have the political saliency with mm. uh, voters that Republicans think it does. And the, and the reason is pretty clear. Immigration does not explain why people's prescription drug uh, 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 costs are going up after drug companies got a massive taxpayer giveaway in the Republican tax bill. Kaylee? Zach, you know as well as I do how important the state of California is, how many congressional races are very competitive there. It could be the key to winning the House. California is seeing a rebellion of localities against the state. It's now a sanctuary state out there in California. We know that there are 10,000 MS-13 gang members in this country across 40 states. Illegal border crossings are tripling the efforts to get into our country uh, compared to this time last year. This is a problem. Voters see it. The Harvard Harris poll confirms that for us. 65% supported Trump's immigration plan. It's a winning issue. Democrats can't see it. Uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi has inserted herself in all of this talking about MS-13 gang members. Uh, what do you say about that, Zach? Look, I, I think that this strategy is tried and true. It is trying to tell voters that MS-13 represents the entire Latino community, and voters aren't, aren't, aren't falling for it. You know, I mean, what they are actually Well, nobody falls in for that because it's what, not true. I mean, well, well, no I, one I, I agree that it's not everybody. true, but that is why that's why Republicans continue to bring up MS-13. They're trying to smear an entire entire racial minority with with this uh, with with individual violent criminals. But it's just not going to work because people are seeing their gas prices go up and they're wondering why oil companies are hiking up their gas prices after they got a massive taxpayer giveaway uh, in, in the Republican tax bill. Immigration doesn't explain that fact, but Republicans are trying to make it explain that fact. And, and, and they can't and they're losing because so, of it. So, Kaylee. Uh, Zach wouldn't touch Representative Nancy Pelosi. Uh, what would you say? Yeah, Zach, you couldn't be further from the truth trying to demonize Republicans. This country is the most generous on earth. We welcome 1.1 million illegal immigrants each year, more than any other country in the world. What we stand against is illegal immigration, and what we stand against are the, the small cohort within that are, in fact, MS-13 gang members. And if you think you're going to win an election by saying MS-13 that dismembers bodies has a spark of divinity, in Nancy Pelosi's words, if you think that'll win an election, by all all means try we will welcome that messaging you can't name a single race this in 2018 or 2017 that you have won based on the issue of immigration and the reason is because people are seeing through your race baiting tactics to distract us from the main issues about why people's premiums are going up 
uh, why people's gas prices are going up, why people's prescription drugs are going up. Immigration does not answer any of those questions. Right, That's that what this election is going to be. I want to give Kayla the last word on this issue. Z Zach, you might have missed the four special elections uh, that we won in 2017. We did win them. In very immigration Republican was districts. Discussed, <laughs> and we will, win, we will win again in 2018. All right. We have Democrats more to talk about. San Francisco, so. so I want you guys to sit tight during the commercial. Uh, we are now learning the plane carrying a top North Korean official is landing right now in New York City. I'm looking out of the corner of my eye on the big wall because I'm seeing a lot of activity uh, near the security entrance that we've been watching all day. Uh, he is set to meet with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as they work towards setting, us a, setting up a summit between President Trump and the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. We're watching this picture closely as we get fresh pics of him on the ground landing. We'll bring them to you. Stay close. Hi, everyone. I'm Dana Perino. We are waiting for Sarah Sanders. She'll brief reporters on a busy news day. Plus, Mike Pompeo meeting with the president at the top of the hour before he heads to New York to meet with a top North Korean official. And a troubling case we've been telling you about on the show, growing bipartisan calls for the president to commute the sentence of Matthew Charles. Who is he and why is a reality TV star even involved? That story and more on The Daily Briefing. Breaking news. North Korea's former spy chief has landed on the ground in New York City. He's expected now to meet with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as the two parties work toward a much anticipated summit between President Trump and North Korea's dictator. Uh, he's on the ground. He's here. And let's bring back now our power panel, Zach Bacanis and Kaylee McEnany. I, I want to start with the, the picture, which is outside of customs at JFK. And we understand meeting the plane where the North Korean uh, top official is there uh, is a black car. So we're waiting for that. As that happens, if there's something to show you live, we'll take you there. Um, but in the meantime, I, I want to just get your quick thoughts now as the summit goes forth, at least for now. Kaylee? This is extraordinary. You know, for 27 years, presidents have tried and failed on North Korea. But President Trump, in, in just 18 months, um, has done quite a bit. You look at the securing the release of three hostages, the fact that we're on the precipice of a meeting and North Korea is not demanding that we lift the sanctions. They're uttering the word denuclearization, the destruction of that nuclear test site. It's extraordinary what this president has done. And Mike Pompeo uh, is included in that. The Secretary of State, last time he met with the North Korea, we saw mm -hmm. hostages be set free. So what's going to come of this? We'll see. You know, uh, Zach, you and I have talked about this and you have reminded me that, you know, not all Democrats see this the same way. Why are there some who won't give this president credit? I, I had guests on earlier who absolutely do give him credit for this. Look, I mean, I think it's absolutely great that we are trying diplomacy. Diplomacy is a lot better than going to war. But one of the things, I mean, the Kim regime has been asking for a meeting for years now, so accepting it one time is not an achievement. What would be an achievement is verifiable, complete, irreversible denuclearization. Not mentioning the word denuclearization, but agreeing to actually dismantle the nuclear program, to agreeing to a verification regime that goes on long after uh, the, the summit um, ends. That has not been achieved yet. And we have seen in the past the North Korean regime agree to things like blow up uh, uh, facilities for, uh, for the cameras. They have agreed to um, meet on a, on, a, on a lower level uh, b before. And so if, if at the end of this agreement there is not verifiable, irreversible um, uh, uh, reductions of nuclear uh, uh, weapons to the level of zero forever, uh, this is not a successful summit. So what the president has said is that, you know, it may be more incremental. And, and that's just about the dismantling. What other political experts are saying that for the president politically, what this does is it sets up a conversation now with the regime that has wanted a conversation, as you point out, Zach, but has to put some stuff on the table now. That has not happened. Kaylee? Right, and I think we will see them put stuff on the table. You know, we already saw the release of those hostages, but what's clear is we finally have a president who means action. He's a tough negotiator. He's not going to allow North Korea to come in and step on the United States. He's going to demand true denuclearization. This is not the Obama model of strategic patience. This is maximum pressure. This is not going to be a deal where, like we saw with Obama and Iran, $400 million of cash are given, and yet no hostages are released, and there are no uh, security and assurances. 
promises that Iran uh, will be free from nuclear weapons. This is the exact opposite side of the coin, and it will work because we have a president, President Trump, who is the great negotiator. You know, the president is uh, want to say, and his supporters and team members and, and White House staffers say that this is promises made, promises kept in motion as he pulls toward the summit if it happens. Zach, what is the Democrat counterpart to that other than just supporting it? Which might not the, be a bad idea. The Democrat counterpart is we are very excited to see the deal maker in action. They have mm. set very high standards for what this deal needs to look like. Both uh, Trump, Bolton, and Pompeo have said that there needs to be complete verifiable mm -hmm. and irreversible denuclearization down to zero and a verification regime that goes into perpetuity. They, that is a standard that they have set. He is the deal maker. He needs to come away from this summit with that deal. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's just mm. going to be another weak deal. Um, is it a bust if they have more conversations, though? Perhaps it's just the beginning. I have to let you guys go. There's breaking news. The North Korean dictator, uh, first-hand man on the ground.